Uh, we weren't quite sure how this was going to work. The waving does it, and they're, they're already ahead of me. Okay. So, so my interest in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency goes way back to the mid to late 70s. Uh, and, and then along came the 80s. And you've seen from what Sandy Sandhouse said that there was this sort of gap where therapy became available. And uh, everyone was telling me that alpha-1 antitrypsin was no longer a problem because it was sorted. Uh, and that meant that I could not get research funding for love nor money. But as a clinician, I knew that it wasn't simple and straightforward, and I think most people who now work in the field agree that it isn't. And we are one of the countries that just did not have augmentation therapy for the same very reasons that Sandy says. You have to do a proper trial to convince the English that you have a treatment that works. So, the ADAPT program is what I would consider to be one of my most innovative opportunities in my life. So with discussion between me and in those days Bayer, um, they were saying, well, why can't you, why can't you do uh, get therapy in the UK? And I said, because there's no trial. And they said, well, could you do a trial? And I said, no. And they said, why not? I said, because people are looking at the wrong thing. And they said, okay, well, what would you look at? And so the ADAPT program was started. And, and a lot of you will know that the, the sort of not prominent thing about lung function is the FEV1. The FEV1 has been the bane of my life because people pay attention to the FEV1 and very little else. Now, this is where you, you can start with, uh, with lung disease. And here we have, on the, on, the, on the bottom axis here, the FEV1. And here on the vertical axis, we have the patient's health status. So the higher up this axis people are, the worse their health is. And you can see that there is a relationship, a relationship that we describe by putting a little line in there and then looking at the statistical significance of that line. And that's fine. FEV1 relates to health status. But, you know, here, here's a patient, oh, oops, let me go here. Here's a patient whose lung function is pretty much normal, but with very, very bad health status. And, and then here's a patient who's got very, very bad lung function, but with pretty good health status. And so for an individual patient, the FEV1 means nothing. But that's where we focused, and that was where I came in and said, we, we've got to stop this. So, we set up the ADAPT registry program. And this is how it's gone since 1996, with recruitment to our program of patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in the UK. And there we are, we're, we're up over 1,000 patients as of the end of last year. So that's a lot of patients, and studied in very great detail on an annual basis to try and learn a little bit more about what this disease is all about. Now, what we accept, and most of the time we accept that these patients, if they have lung disease, will have emphysema. And that's what this slide just shows. Uh, here's a, a three-dimensional CT scan. Many of you will have CT scans of a patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. White means there's plenty of lung there. Black means the lung is missing. And that is where the typical emphysema of the typical patient occurs. Now, the FEV1 is a very poor marker of emphysema. And yet, that's the measure that we do, pay most attention to. So, what we have is CT densitometry. And here's CT densitometry. And it's looked at here, again, with the patient's health. And you can see it's just as good or just as bad as the FEV1, but it is more specific. So we decided we were going to start here and really start to look at and understand CT scanning in this disease. Well, that means you're using a new test, and it means you've got to show that that new test tells you things about the patient. So this was one of the studies we did. We looked at the density of the lungs, and we looked at how it affected people's exercise. So there you can see a really quite good relationship between how dense the lungs are, how much emphysema is there, and how much exercise the individual can do. So all of a sudden people say, well actually yes, maybe density does tell you something that's relevant to the patient. How much can they do? Well, there's a better measure of the, uh, of, of the uh, emphysema process that a physiologist would tell you, and that is this measure, KCO. Well, KCO is gas transfer. That's telling you how easy it is for gases to get from the air into the body through the lung. And of course, the emphysema is occurring at exactly where that gas transfer takes place. So again, 
Here's a small data. Yes, the density relates to this gas transfer measurement. So it's also starting to tell us a little bit more about the disease. And to conclude what was then quite a lot of work, we put together this whole concept, which is if the disease is emphysema, we know emphysema affects lung function, we know lung function affects exercise, and exercise is important for the patient's quality of life. But we know that the CT scan is the most direct measure of the emphysema process. And that also affects the exercise capacity, also affects the quality of life. And of course, right in the middle here, you can see that these all cross-relate. So emphysema affects uh, exercise capacity, HRCT reflects the lung function. So you're putting it all together as, as showing what the, it is that we think is the problem. What we then went on to do was to show that actually uh, the CT scan was a better predictor of the patient's mortality than any of the physiological things that people have measured to date. Now that's important because you're saying, but you know, as density gets worse, the patient's life becomes more and more at risk. And so this is just some data from, from that early study. Look at our patients who survived, those who didn't survive, and those who didn't survive because of a lung problem. So of course, uh, that there's survival issues for other health reasons. And just looking here at the, uh, the CT densitometry, the higher that value is, the more emphysema is present. And so the people who are dying from their respiratory condition are the people who've got the worst emphysema. And it is the best predictor of mortality of anything that we measure. So this now brings it into being a very, very important measure in, in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So, so that started us thinking, and so we said, well, okay, now we know how to monitor this disease. We can now design trials with this as an outcome. But is it that simple and straightforward? And the answer is, no, it's not that simple and straightforward. And here I come back to tell you that the FEV1 is a terrible thing if you want to study the disease. We know that if you have a brother or sister with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, they're likely to have lung disease, or they're likely to have liver disease if the other person has. So here is what we call our non-index sibling. This is the relative of somebody who's come to see us because they actually have a, a lung disease already due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And all we've done here is we've just said, well, what's the FEV1 in this sister or brother? And what's the FEV1 in this sister or brother? And there's absolutely no relationship. So just having the deficiency doesn't mean to say you're going to be the same as your brother or sister, or even the next door neighbor who's not deficiency. So that's FEV1. On the other hand, if you look at the gas transfer, and now the gas transfer telling you now about the emphysema process, it is very similar. So brothers and sisters, if they have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, are likely to have a similar impairment in their gas transfer. Not exactly the same, because the one who doesn't go to the doctor is usually that bit better than the one who went to the doctor. So you can see that relationship. And in fact, if you then say, well, what about the densitometry? The densitometry also shows the relationship. But here's the rub. It doesn't show that relationship if you look at the base of the lungs. It only shows that relationship if you look at the top of the lungs, which is the area where we don't think people should get their emphysema. So we're now learning that it may be, certainly in brothers and sisters, the relationship is affected, is affected by the top of the lung, not the bottom of the lung. So that's a bit of a problem too. So the idea behind all getting this information is, well, what about alimentation therapy? That's really the aim of going forward here. And, and as you've already heard from Sandy, if you use the FEV1, you will never do a study, as, as that is a difficult outcome. And as I hope I've shown you, it's not what the disease is all about. It is a very distant marker of the disease process that we're looking at. So, Sandy also told you, that the NIH study, this big registry in the, in, the, in the USA, showed that there was a benefit from augmentation therapy. And I've just done this as this sort of slide. Here is the decline in the, uh, in the lung function as measured by the FEV1, because that's what people measured. And, and here is the starting FEV1. And you can see in orange are patients who did not have augmentation, and in blue, patients who do have augmentation. And you can look at this data and say, well, actually, if you give augmentation up here, that looks like a bad thing. Um, if you give it here, well, there's not really very much difference. If you give it here, there is a difference, and, and that's a sort of limited range of FEV1. And then when you've got very severe disease, again, there's no difference. 
Now, I think that people have missed the point. And, and I hope that uh, we're going to change our concept worldwide about who does and doesn't need treatment. The point is that if a treatment is going to show an effect on something that's getting worse, it's got to be getting worse pretty quickly. Otherwise, you won't show an effect. So what happens to the FEV1? And this is data, again, from our, our group of patients in the UK. If your FEV1 is pretty good, over a period of time, it really doesn't change very much. If your FEV1 is now becoming abnormal, so in the middle range of defect, then you start to see progression. And, and then as it goes lower, the progression is still there, but when it's very low, you can't see progression in FEV1. And this has led some people to say, well, when the lung function gets to that level, there's no benefit from augmentation at all. Now, I'm not going to show you that I think that that's a nonsense. The next thing, of course, is that gas transfer is the more specific measure. Um, it's a more difficult measure to make. And again, sort of early in the disease, you don't see much change. And then as the disease progresses, when it started to get much worse, even when it's very, very bad, when the FEV1 is not changing at all, the gas transfer is declining at its most. So that's where you would see an effect on gas transfer, only when it's declining most. But of course, we were interested in the density of the lung. And here's data now saying, well, looking at the density of the lung, you can measure it many ways, but, but this is the sort of gold standard method. It's called the percentile 15. It doesn't matter what it's called, really. It is just measuring the loss of density. And you can see it's about the same all the way through the disease process. So even when the FEV1 is not changing, the lung density is. And even when the gas transfer is not changing up as much, the density is. So the emphysema process is much, much more ahead of our measurements of physiology. Okay, um, now that's okay, but someone says, but, but you know, we're interested in the FEV1. And I'm saying, no, we're not, we're interested in the density. And they say, well, but they're not the same thing. So you then have to do this sort of thing, which is saying, well, if we have enough data and we look at the density de degrading, does it relate overall to the FEV1 degrading? And that's what this, this data shows. This is data from many years in a very well characterized group of patients saying it does just that. If you have enough data, then you can show that the density does relate to the FEV1 that I think is the measure you guys shouldn't be measuring. So we, we were able to tick that box, and that now means you can start to do a clinical trial. But you can do your clinical trial now with some positive findings that density is the way to do the trial. Why is that important? This is a slide showing the sensitivity of the things we measure in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency to change. So basically, the higher the score on here, the more it is changing, the more sensitive it is to change. And so the more likely you are to find an effect if you do a clinical trial. So right over here, this is patient's health status. It's got a sensitivity of one. You could never do a study saying, does it affect the patient's health status? It's years and years, thousands of patients. FEV1, well, FEV1 comes up a little bit. It's around about two. Gas transfer comes up even further. That's, that's a more specific emphysema marker to about four. But these are all the measures of density. You can see they're up around seven. So this is the best opportunity to find a treatment effect if you're going to study this disease. And that's how the, the clinical trials were originally this, the done. And of course, the, the first trial specifically asking this question was the exactly trial that was funded in those days by Bayer Biologicals uh, that we ran in the countries that were fortunate enough or unfortunate enough, depending on how you look at it, to not have augmentation therapy. I say unfortunate, that means patients don't get it, but fortunate means that we could do the study. Um, so, so that's what we did, and, and there was a lot of discussion about how you should or shouldn't analyze the data, uh, because it was a new technology. And so this was uh, some of the data showing in, in the sort of uh, white book. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Okay, in the in the white, yeah, it's not happening. It's good. In the white histograms is the, the density progression on placebo and here on treatment. And then people start to look at this thing, the p-value. Is that a statistically significant study? Well, if you look at those, they do not achieve what a, a, a scientist or what a, 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 certainly a drug licensing body would call significant. So, so we're a, bit, a little bit stuck with that. But the reason we're stuck with that is because actually the emphysema is not what we thought the emphysema was. Here's a typical alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient patient. 
So here's the emphysema, which I showed you before, the bases. And you can see that that's where the least dense parts of the lung are, where the emphysema is. But here's another alpha hypertrophy deficient patient. And now the black areas are actually at the top of the lung. This patient has emphysema, but it's at the top of the lung. And again, as you come up the lung, you can see that's where most of the emphysema is. So we've now got two types of alpha-1 antitrypsin patient, and, and, and is it the same disease or not the same disease? Because this is the kind of disease that smokers without alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency get. Well, we started to say, let's look then at the different regions of the lung. And so this is work that was done by David Farr in, in my group. And so we said, well, in the trial, let's look at the bottom of the lung, the middle of the lung, and the top of the lung. And here in blue are the patients on placebo, and you can see the progression of the emphysema is exactly the same, whether it's at the bottom or the top. But on treatment, this is the difference at the bottom. It's statistically significant at the bottom. It's much less in the middle, and it's hardly there at all at the top. So the process that's going on at the top is different to the process that's going on at the bottom. But we now know that augmentation affects the process at the bottom. And of course, as Sandy has said, there's, there's been a bigger study which has just come to fruition, and that data will be shown soon, um, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing the outcome of that. But what we were able to do, because people did not accept that simple exactly study, was to say, well, there was one other study, which was done by the Dutch and the Danish, and they did it off their own bat years and years ago, looking at giving infusions once a month, but a, but a much bigger infusion. And so the combined study, we, we, we had the objective of saying, well, if we put the data together from both studies, will that tell us more? Will it now become a significant study? But of course, there were also patients who've been on the study in Denmark in the first study, and also patients who were in Denmark who were in the second study. So anybody who was in the first study, we took out of the second study, and that's on the understanding we thought the second study was better, and we left them in the first study, which, if anything, would bias against finding an effect. And so that's the way we analyze the data. And here's the same sort of analysis that you saw from the exact trial, now putting both of those studies together. And you can see in green is the progression on the placebo, in blue the progression in augmentation, and you can see the p-values at the bottom now are much lower values, and they are now statistically significant. So a lot of work has gone into generating data that people would say is significant. However, there remain skeptics. And people said, you can't put two studies together. And we said, you can, because we did. And they said, well, you can't take two negative studies, because they would call each one negative in its own right, and end up with a positive. And I said, well, if you multiply minus one by minus one, it becomes plus one. So you can put two negatives together and get a positive. And here's two negative studies that are clearly positive. And the CSL study, has the same or even more patients in it than we've got in this. So if we can show it here, that's what we expect to see with the CSL data. Um, now, let's come back a little bit to my final slide, which is where, where Sandy started. But when should we start treatment? Now, my view is that we should start treatment as soon as possible, because I think the more the disease progresses, the more of a mess it becomes, and that becomes much less an alpha-1 driven disease and more a COPD type driven disease. And I think that means that we've got to get in early with this treatment. So this is data again from our, from our patient cohort. And I just want you to concentrate on the blue triangles. These are the never smokers in, in the United Kingdom who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And we have something like about 270 of these individuals at different ages. And we said, well, what, what's their lung function like? Um, and so we've been able to plot each one age versus here the FEV1 and then the question we asked is when do those patients start to deviate from normal and so the red lines that you can see there are the limits of when those patients are starting to deviate as a group from normal and you can see they're deviating about the age of 40 45 that's the FEV1 on the other hand if we look at the gas transfer the much more specific emphysema measure and do the same exercise, you can see this is now deviating from normal in the late 20s. And if we look at the densitometry, that's the, the CT scans, that's also deviating from normal around the late 20s. So we can pick up very early disease 
if we have the individuals before they start to get disease. And we can pick it up in their sort of 20s to 30s, and if those are never smokers, we know that those are patients who are going on in the future to, to develop severe disease. And treatment at that stage would, I think, be very, very well justified. And my final slide is this one. This comes back to why are we bothered about the FEV1? And we're bothered about it because people tell us we should be bothered about it. So here's a patient, and, they, and the little pink dots are the FEV1 followed over several years, seven years in this individual. You can see the FEV1 stable. And people would say, what if the FEV1 stable? You shouldn't give the patient augmentation. And, and I think that's you know, logical, but it's not right. If you look at the blue circles, that is the patient's gas transfer. So this patient's got a stable FEV1, but over these seven years, that gas transfer has inexorably gone down. And that's what we're trying to protect. So we've got to get beyond the FEV1. We've got to get beyond late disease. We've got to start to understand, still, why some individuals get a problem and some don't. And I will tell you, I have an 86-year-old smoker, 20 a day, whose lung function isn't normal, but is charging around, doing her shopping, and doing everything she wants. Why? She should be dead. Why isn't she? And we need to understand these things, and if we're going to use augmentation sensibly, that must be our continuing challenge. Thank you.